Very well, Mr. Sinclair. How about yourself? Pretty good, pretty good. Just enjoying this Texas heat and the mosquitoes, but... Oh, yeah. You know what? <laughs> Let me give you folks an idea of how hot it really is in Texas right now. I hadn't seen a fly or a mosquito in a month. Me neither. Honestly. Yeah. If they get out... Because <laughs> every time they flew out from underneath the tree, <laughs> it fried them right then, yeah. The 4th of July. Yeah. <laughs> We kept seeing these little sparks at night. We didn't know what they well, were. They were fireflies, but yeah, they well, weren't. I never had no fireflies around here. Yeah, too many. It was all them gnats and flies and mosquitoes getting baked. So that's good. If the winter can't kill them, I guess the sun will take care of itself. Huh? That's right. Nature's course. <laughs> that's right. So nature's course. Anyway, we, I, I, we, I, I'm going to mention something that we did. This was uh, inspirational. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Do dogs have feelings? Can they love you? I'm going to give everybody the scientific skinny, which has evolved. But there was a gentleman named Rene Descartes. If you're into science, you know who he is. He's like one of the God founding fathers of, of science, right? He lived in the 1600s. And he, for reasons that would take a whole podcast to explain, I won't go into, had reason to study animals and dogs and the things that they're capable of doing, okay? And he came up with the theory that they are like robots. They didn't have robots back then, but everything a dog does is stimulus and response. They don't think they don't have emotions. Only humans, because what made animals lesser than us was religion. Yeah. You know, we're gods. So they were assimilated into they were assimilated into existence and right. no thoughts, no brain, nothing. Right. And, yeah. Right. They yeah. just So that's the foundation for science. And science is like law. You have once a precedent is set, the new scientists coming along may have a better idea, may have a more accurate idea but they try not to overturn precedent. Because then the other scientists, A, are gonna laugh at them, mm -hmm. and B, uh, if they turn out to be wrong, they're really gonna be out of business. So you don't overturn precedent. If you learn something new, you gotta figure out a way to, to make it popular and usable without upsetting the apple cart or what came before you. Yep. So Descartes started the theory that dogs and animals don't have emotions, they don't have feelings, and they really don't think or reason. So dogs don't have a conscience? No, no. They're just beasts. Right. So, hmm. and that was in 1630-something. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we fast forward to the 1800s. Now science is really developing into something, what, we could, what they'd called the hard sciences mm -hmm. of, of physics and, and chemistry and things of this nature. And the people into science were coming up with new ways to look and think about things. And one of the things they wanted to discover was animals and their brains. The problem was they realized they couldn't measure an IQ in a dog. Right. They could see, observe, and measure a behavior in a dog, like a dog chases a rabbit or by so the from 1800 till the 1900s all they looked at was the behavior of all animals then there was this belief that developed that domesticated animals were not as intelligent and didn't have to think as much as wild animals because wild animals had to do it on their own Domestic animals had us teaching them. That was that's that's the way science works, Scott. I know. So they didn't start studying dogs until the mid or early well after World War II, because before that time, if you th if you go back and some of the television shows about animals, mm -hmm. I guarantee you, you won't see one thing about a dog that was done in 1950 unless it was Lassie. Rin Tin Tin. Oh, Rin Tin Tin. That. All the animals, <laughs> all the an our, our hero, by the way, all the animal shows and science shows were about 
dolphins and elephants and baboons and bonobo monkeys and Scott. I mean, yep. no, just, just kidding, just kidding. So it is what it is. So where are we at with animals and dogs, particular today? So basically, everything is based on the physiology and psychology and science. It's all based off human. Human. What really happens in a dog's head? <laughs> everything is behavior study. Behavior study. Okay. Right. Right. But for example, the absolute. How can I say this? The growth of an animal's brain, especially dogs, and learning emotion like love, disgust, con contentment, disgust. distress. Yeah. Dogs get disgusted all the time. You know, excitement, love. Yeah. A absolutely. Dog, a dog's brain, her science, is telling growing at two and a half years old. Dog is fully mature. And fully like mature. Thing. Okay. In brain. And yeah. you know, females probably a year and a half because they're women. <laughs> But you know, and they're saying also and women that, are always in a hurry. Yeah. And according to humans, how humans grow, you can, you're comparing humans to hunting dogs on the growth of the emotions. Okay, got it. Right. So, you know, shame, pride, guilt, and contempt in humans come between the ages of three and six years old. Guilt will come about four years old, and contempt in a child will actually decide you recognize at six years old. Really? So they're saying that all the emotions, the negative emotions after, and I don't say they're negative, they are negative emotions. Right. Guilt, contempt. Right. Because it's, it's conscious, it's reasoning. Right? Yeah, it's absolutely, yeah. It starts after three and a half years old. Wow. So a dog stops, brain stops going, and it's the emotions all, the dog is, knows everything he needs to know, and his emotions are fully about two and a half years old. So for science, the rest of the emotions, Dogs cannot reason that way, and to a point, dogs are going to develop to be like their brains didn't develop for that. But I argue to say that dogs will feel guilt, and dogs will feel shame. An example? Uh, example. Uh, so you you have the the most popular belief about dogs. I hear this, and you hear this. Mm -hmm. Carol Ann, she hears this at least two or three times a week. People call about housebreaking, they have a problem. I say, you know, what do you do when your dog poops <clears throat> in the house? <clears throat> and the answer is always, well, I, I don't do anything because I can't catch him in the act. Most popular belief in the world, right? Because dogs don't know that they did that an hour ago. And they don't feel guilt. So you got to catch them in the act or they uh, don't know it. It's going back to dogs have no relation of time. That, right. That's all I'm based off that. Right. Anyway, that's right. interrupt. No, that's all right. No, that's a good point. That's what it's, that's what it's, so. They can't hear your mic. Can you move it up? They can hear you, but they can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Is that on Scott? Okay. Sorry about that. So, what I tell people to do is this. The scientists tell you that you have to catch them in the act. A lot of dog trainers apparently are telling everybody you got to catch them in the act. Mm. Butch Capel, who stepped in a whole lot of stuff over the years <laughs> in his living room, says, no, you ain't got to catch him in the act. Because let me tell you, when I stepped in that, I called that dog in there and I told him what to do and how I felt about it. And the next time, there wasn't no next time. Right. So, and here's, here's how I know. Here's how I know they understand guilt and when they're doing something wrong. What I tell all our customers to do who don't believe me when I say you don't have to catch him in the act, is what you're going to do is when the next time you there's an accident in the house call your dog scold your dog let him know that upsets you and you're not going to allow it mm -hmm. and then kick him outside okay the second time you come home and find a mess in the house the scientists will tell you in all their studies i i, I look at a whole lot of them from around the world they will tell you that the pet owners don't really understand because the dogs aren't feeling guilt they're responding to your stern tones and your anger and they know you're going to punish them yeah they read they read your body yeah they're reading you yeah. that has, and that has nothing to do with them pooping in the house no they can't reason that they can't see that they're not they're too they just can't do that no so how do you know the difference you call when you go to the 
the second crime the scene. The scene of the crime. Yes. And you call your dog like this. Fido, come here, buddy, buddy. Come here, pal. Just as happy. And I got little milk bones for you. And I got liver treats for you. Come on in here. And Fido will come walking in. And I guarantee he's going to step in that door when he hears your happy voice. And before he goes two steps into that room, he's going to see you standing right by that little gift he left you and he's gonna go holy shit yeah. <laughs> stuff yeah it ain't holy no more yep so yeah you know i've been telling people to do it that way for 15 16 years now and i have yet to have anyone call me back and say well he acted you know mm -hmm. he didn't act guilty he came in and loved me for it so i think we got i think that alone proves that they, they, they can remember oops yeah yeah and, and they know and they feel guilt yeah they know yeah yeah so uh, these dog dogs are smarter than they're let it to be oh yeah most animals are yes like you said because of the you know the old ways of religion and whatnot but if you go back like Pavlov and all these ways and all this with the positive uh, stimulus mm -hmm. and the reaction that's that's all science that's great yeah but dogs aren't robots no if not. they were we didn't need dog trainers that's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that, and there's another big thing. So let's let's look at love and devotion because we we're talking about that emotion. There is. We I, I, I'm do I do another little series on Wednesday, called Dogs and Other Heroes, and what I've done is go back in my library and discover, some of the, really heroic things that dogs and a few other animals. Have done that nobody might be aware of okay just mm -hmm. just to kind of broaden everyone's horizons about the potential and capabilities of animals and I got to admit I was turned on to this one uh, by a good good friend in North Carolina uh, and the, it's a dog named Judy and it was there was so much to do that I did a two-parter I could have done I could have done a whole month on this one dog in World War II, she was attached to this one one British uh, airman, and she was she was anyway. She spent her she spent four or five years in a prisoner of war camp, Japanese prisoner of war camp, and the Japanese guards were trying to shoot her. They were try, they wanted to kill her because at first when she was there. Uh, they tolerated her, but but she'd start beating, or they'd start beating her friend, and she'd go up there and bite him on the butt. And anyway, we had a situation that this dog lived in. They were in the Malaysian jungles, and the the prison guards at this point were trying to kill her. So Frank Williams, her her partner, her friend, trained her. He built. A, an area outside of where the prisoners were camping, deep in the Malaysian jungles, forests. She would stay out there in the daytime, but in the evening, he would whisper her name, whisper, so no one could hear it. And she'd come in from the jungle and spend the nights with Frank and his, wherever they slept, and some of the other airmen and seamen and Navy men that she knew. Mm -hmm. But this dog, who at this time is about, uh, I think, four years old, she was foraging all day long. And of course, all these prisoners are malnourished, underfed, die, dropping dead from starvation. Judy was the dog's name. Judy would had the day to go out and forage and find wild game. And what did she do with the wild game? She'd eat some of it, but then she would bring back to Frank, her human partner, monkeys, snakes, rats. There was a time she brought him an elephant shin bone. <laughs> she spent the whole night digging a hole big enough to bury the shin bone, <laughs> but she did bring him a shin bone. So if you get a chance, go back and look on our YouTube channel Prisoner of War, yes, Judy, 
the prison, the, she, she was officially registered as a prisoner of war. It's an amazing story. It's, it's like I said, it was so much that I put it in two parts. I've since ordered two books, biographies of Judy, written at the time, mm -hmm. so I can learn more about everything she did. But that's what gave me the idea to bring up this subject of do dogs feel love? I don't care what any scientist says. I don't care what any professional trainer out there thinks. This was an animal who was totally free to do whatever she wanted to do. She was in that jungle on her own, out in the woods. She could go about killing food and eating it and then sitting back and taking a big snooze till she wanted to get up and go get something else to eat. And what did she do? She took enough game and instead of eating it all herself, because she never gained any weight. I've seen pictures of her when they first got her back from that prison camp. She never gained any weight, but she took her kill of the day and shared it with all of these people, with Frank Williams and other people in that camp. Now, first off, I don't care what the scientific studies say, she had to make a conscious decision to give up her, her own food. Yeah. And she had to realize the danger that her partner was in yeah. of dying. These are, that's her memorial right there, yeah. yeah. These, this, these are all conscious decisions made by this dog. So, Mr. Scientist, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. And I'll give you some more examples if you want. What do you think, Scott? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. You know, she, she's 14. She lived to be 14. She lived to be what? She, she lived four, to be 14. Lived to be 14, yep. Yeah, she died yep. in 1950. Yep. But uh, no, I just, I read the story too, and just glancing over it, it's just, it's amazing. It's, oh, it's why? Why was she attached? Why? She didn't, she could have just cut tail and hit him with the high country. Yeah. She could have gone and done and lived a great life, but she chose to stay in a and prisoner of war camp. They were on the USS Nat, they got caught yep. in, and they got on the grasshopper, HMS Grasshopper, and caught again. Yep. So she went to two tours of prison camps. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just one time. So she had it down. Yeah, and and here's here's a couple more. There's a dog in... 2000. 2000, uh, early 2000s named Hichaco in Argentina. And he was devoted to his to his master whose name I forget. And Hichaco was a shepherd looking kind of dog, I believe. Anyway, his his owner had a cerebral brain hemorrhage and died on his way home from work one day. They had the funeral Buried the, <clears throat> buried the owner, and two or three days after the funeral, Hichaco disappeared. And there's photographs. I mean, this is everything I'm telling you right now is very well verified. The family just panicked because he, the dog had been so close to the husband, meant so much to him and to each other. They had to find Hichaco, and they started searching this town in Argentina. Finally, somebody went by the graveyard where the, where the owner had been buried, and they and there's photos of it. They found Hichaco, who didn't know. There's no way to be told while you were here and he was at work today he died. Hichaco had gone out on his own and discovered the grave of his master, and they found him sleeping on that grave where he stayed guarding his master until, at the time this article was written, until 2015, and it had been like four years. He never left that grave site. Yep. Or excuse me, that's, that was a dog named Capitan. Hichaco, as long as I got into it, that was Capitan. Hichaco was a, in, Jap in Japan, was an Akita Spitz type dog that every day when his owner went to work, he took a train to work. When he came home at four or five o'clock, whatever time it was, Hichaco had learned to tell the time. 
and he greeted his master at the train station mm -hmm. every day, and they walked home together. There's a lot of theories that people are solid and concrete. Dogs can't tell time. Dogs have emotions. But over and over again, the dogs surprise us. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can't tell me there's a pattern. There's a pattern. The dog has a pattern. How does a dog tell what 6 a.m. to 5 a.m. is? Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of constituency, but everything's good facts. But don't always read, believe what you read, you know. And you dog owners out there, you know you have dogs. You know, emotions and dogs and, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you got a choice, and I tell everybody this if, if they're looking for a dog trainer. If, if your dog trainer says, do this, and you say, I don't want to do that with my dog, then one of two things should happen. The dog trainer would say, okay, if he's a real dog trainer, he should say, well, you don't have to do it that way. That's one technique. If he's a real dog trainer, he's got a whole bunch of techniques to do anything. So best case scenario, you say, I don't. I don't want my dog to do that because you know your dog better than anybody. That's right. And the trainer doesn't say, "Well, here's a second option." He simply says, "Well, you got to do it this way." You got you what? You got to do it my way. You, you got to. You got to. Huh. And at that point, then I got to go. There you go. That's it. That's how you finish that statement. Yeah, yeah. Because there are things about your dog that he will never ever know. What you got, Carolyn? Okay, that's and one. Then, there's a question. What are your thoughts on using a dog's emotions such as frustration to create aggression? Well, let's do the, you want to do the first one first or the second one first? So basically, one is seven, right? Years? Yeah. So the maturity of the brain is faster. And the dogs, to me, a dog is more... Six years old, yes and no. Because a dog can have a conversation with me. And dog, but you know what though? That, that's a good possibility because dogs can be conniving and ruthless. But, but, but how many problems can they solve as a six year old? But not many. Six year old, see that's. Well, here's the deal though. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe a five year old. So you put a box in front of a kid with shapes in it. I guarantee a dog will figure that out. Right. They have actual games with, right. for dogs that equal about five, six, maybe. There's no reading comprehension or nothing, but it's more of a, of a uh, you know, shapes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm just saying that's. So. They, if you go, the average age by most scientists uh, give dogs the credit of, of uh, a two and a half year old. Yep. Okay. Some, there's some. All shoots, not necessarily done by scientists, but by behaviorists and dog training groups that say a six-year-old. I disagree with all of those. I think, I don't know, I don't know a six-year-old, if you had a, an equivalent, physically equivalent sheep that you could take out and in two to three weeks, teach him to go over here, stop, freeze, run over here, cut this one off, bring them back in. I see dogs, people don't think about this, I see dogs learning all sorts of maneuvers. Complex. Yeah, complex maneuvers. Okay. That, you know, here, here's something, all right, so we, we got to give it up to them for their nose, and we know that what they smell is not invisible to them, although it is to us, but I have reasoned with you and let you know that if you smell this odor and I tell you to find it, I want you to go and find where a bomb is hidden. I want you to go for miles and miles. I want you to disregard wind changes. I want you to disregard the five or six other rabbits, leopards, whatever, ran across this trail. <laughs> well, Judy had leopards. <laughs> I want you to disregard all that and stay disciplined enough to get to the end and find the lost child. I'll play devil because devil's advocate. Okay. Hey, you know, them herding dogs, it's all patterned. They learned that pattern once, they get the pattern down. Yep. 
It's all patterned. Right? So yep. the cow turns this way. Yep. So how, okay, exactly. It's like picking those things out of that box, right? Two-year-old go there and go, ee, and drop something in there. And he's still two years old, right? Mm -hmm. And a month later, he's still, he doesn't know. That dog, that dog, boom, boom. After a while, they learn. Yep. They grow. Yep, yep. So they actually, the cortex of their brain is more capable than we think it is. Yeah. Here, here's an exact answer to that, and then we'll go to the aggression and frustration. Look up a dog named Rico. He's an Australian, either an Australian Shepherd or Border Collie. The dog has learned 305 different words. And it's, it's been authenticated time and time and time and time and time again. I believe he's the dog and was owned by the uh, Virginia College professor. Uh, then there's another one in Poland who had, was at 285. I don't know a lot of six-year-olds, I sure as hell don't know any two-year-old who can understand words for 300 different objects. To answer that question, everything is based off human emotion, human psyche. They really, you can cut a brain open, but they don't really know to get inside a dog's brain without cutting it open, you really don't know. Right. So it's, it's yeah. Second question, can you use frustration <clears throat> to teach a dog to invite work? You use frustration to teach a dog a whole lot of stuff. You know, uh, my daddy used to use frustration to teach me, you know, basic math. He'd say, son, you wanna, uh, you want to come out here and go swimming with us tonight? We're going to take the dogs out. We're going to go out to the pond and do some swimming. And I'd say, damn right I do. And he'd say, well, you got to do your math first. And I'd go, okay, I'll go do it. So, you know, it's, you, you, you're going to use all their emotions because you are supposed to be the smartest one of the bunch. I have, I have seen times when I wondered if that was the case. So, but yeah, but uh, frustration is it primarily by work at certain levels? Once you get to a certain level, it, it, it becomes you need to frustrate them, right? And that's where you can build their courage and, and really see. Yep, I agree with you, Butch, 100%. So, frustration is an emotion, yeah. And play it, play on their hearts. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So, if anyone you know, if you've got any other questions, please answer them. We're going to probably go off off a little bit uh, to a different direction next week mm -hmm. and do uh, the thing about doing something on the Western Shepherd because we don't think enough people know what they're missing out yeah. on a great new breed of dog. Wait, well, we got a question. Um, no, someone, uh, Troy said um, in Tachi, a dog's tail for the one that would wait for the owner, and uh, they actually made a statue of where the dog would sit and wait for him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you, Troy. That's great to know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're going to do our Western, we're going to do a little something on Western Shepherd, the low to no shed shepherd. If you can imagine a shepherd that doesn't shed, be here next week. Because this week, you know how it is nowadays, you have to be hypoallergenic. That's right. Hypo That's right. That's right. And, and when you get the chance, go back, look on our channel for uh, dogs and other heroes. We've got three episodes up now. We've got a whole bunch more coming. Yep. We'll show you some dogs that you won't believe could do what they can do. And you will no longer wonder if they really have the intelligence of a six-year-old. You will instead be prob probably sending them down to LSU for a master's degree. Yes. And with that, folks. <laughs> like and subscribe. And remember, it's all about the dogs.